Well, good morning. Welcome to virtual Sunday school. Uh, not what anybody had hoped was going to happen, uh, but we are glad to be able to have the technology to uh, reach you in your homes for those of you who are watching online. As far as, uh, I'm just going to turn the volume down really quick in the mains here because it's pretty loud. There we go. That's a little better. Uh, we are week 10. Hopefully everybody has gotten a handout uh, for the service this, or the, the lesson this morning. Uh, those of you at home, I put a comment in the Facebook page that links to it, and I believe I put a comment on the YouTube page that provides a link to it. Remember, you can also log in to your My Faith Baptist Church account, and under the resources tab at the top, you'll see every handout from every week. So we are on week 10 right now. We're going to talk about historical translations. We're going to trace the Old and New Testament as they were translated all the way up until about the 17th century. Uh, we're going to trace, trace that path through the Latin side, and we're going to trace that path through the Greek language side. And we're going to look at what was available to the church. Uh, before we get there, let's just review where we have come from. Last week, we have talked about the topic of textual criticism, that science of finding the original wording of a document whose manuscript original has been lost, based on the evidence of the manuscripts that we have today. We saw that this process of textual criticism, when done correctly, produces three components. It gives us a critical text. This is a text where you have chosen the best reading out of all the variants that are there and have decided this is most likely the original. It tells you why that decision was made. We called that the critical apparatus. And it lists all of the sources that were available to it. So how many documents provide it? Every single New Testament that we have, and every Old Testament that you have, is some form of critical text. Also, by looking at some of the types of variants, we saw there were spelling errors. We saw there were errors in grammar. We saw that there were errors in oversight from scribes copying things. And we came to the following conclusions. Of the approximately 400,000 variations that we have, in over 5,800 manuscripts, over 20,000 in the uh, other languages, Latin, Syriac, Old Ethiopic, and over a million quotations from the early church fathers, that about 10% of those 400,000 variants have any meaningful translatable uh, difference. And of that, half of those have a, any chance of going back to the original. And of that half that goes back potentially to the original, there isn't a single doctrine. There is no church that exists today that uses um, the ESV that has a different doctrinal statement than when they used uh, the Revised Standard Version or the King James Version. So these things have not changed any single doctrine. And that's agreed upon both by Christian theologians and by uh, scholars who are atheistic or agnostic who are opponents of Christianity. Universally, they all agree the variants we have do not affect doctrine. I'm providing you with some more uh, references that you can follow up for further study. I will post these links in the comment section on both YouTube and Facebook. Uh, and if you have a handout, you can download that and activate the link so you don't have to try to type them into your machine. So let's just pause and go before the Lord in prayer before we look at what we'll talk about uh, today. Father, I thank you that you have given us a faith that isn't blind, Father, that uh, as, as the author of Hebrews said, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the assurance of things not seen. Uh, and Lord, we know that that hope isn't an empty hope. It's a hope that's built on a confidence of who you are, a confidence on what you have done. And I ask, Father, that as we examine the way you have moved in your word, throughout history, through the different translation uh, processes, that we would have greater and greater assurance of what we hold in our hand as your word, uh, 
and that we would be uh, just awestruck with the privilege you've given to our people, uh, people today. And Father, I pray this, uh, this teaching today would glorify you, that you would keep me um, far from error and, and in line with the truth of what uh, your word has revealed and what your history you've moved throughout has revealed. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, overview of what we're going to talk about today. We have five kind of topics that we're going to go over. We're going to talk about why it's important for you to understand the history of how you got your Bible. We're going to trace that history as it existed under the Roman Empire, the influence. And we're going to look at the development of the, the Latin Bible and the Greek Bible and how those got translated into English. We're also going to, uh, so that's the fourth and the fifth, the Latin to English and the Greek to English. So why is it important to know history? I ask that question as if there's people in here, and I know um, those of you online can't answer, so I'll, I'll do better. Uh, first of all, history is going to reveal for us our presuppositions. What does that mean? What does it mean to have a presupposition? Uh, a presupposition is where uh, you have brought to what you're going to read an understanding of what that means in advance. For example, you may have grown up in a Roman Catholic church environment where in your mind the ultimate authority is what is taught to you by your church by the priest, by the pope, that this oral tradition has more authority than what's in Scripture. And so when you read Scripture, your presupposition is going to be to align Scripture to what you have been taught. You may have grown up in an um, environment where uh, there was a, a strong fundamentalist, King James type, that's the only word of God. And when you see something different, your presupposition will tell you, what you see is different must not be correct because you're applying knowledge that isn't in the text, but knowledge from where you grew up. And so presuppositions are important. History is also important to understand because it gives us perspective. It is an extraordinarily unique situation in the history of God's people that you would be able to personally in your home open God's word and have access to that. History is also apologetical. I have friends who, can, who continually insist we can't know that Scripture is correct because it's been translated too many times. It's been handed down too many times. And although you can answer those now objectively with facts from history, you can't expect that to change a person's heart because that happens by the Word of God. Faith comes from hearing the word of God, but it is apologetical. It can stop them from claiming that it isn't true and break down that barrier. It's, it's pre-evangelical. It will remove that obstacle from hearing God's word when they know they can have confidence in it. It also shows us God's handiwork. History is important because it is his story. You may have heard that before. It shows us how God has preserved his word throughout all ages, in spite of attempts at, at causing corruption to it, God has, in fact, uh, preserved his word. Um, so, so how did we get God's word? How did, how did this translation process happen? Well, the first thing that happened is as the actual gospel message was being sent out, it was not originally sent out on written documents. It was actually originally sent out by word of mouth, when we read in 1 Corinthians that, uh, for example, in chapter 15, that the Apostle Paul chastised them for leaving the gospel that they had heard. And as time progressed, some 30 years later, it began to become something that was written down to churches as letters to different churches. After those letters came out, came the four gospels. And we saw that those handwritten copies were spread worldwide rapidly. So if somebody had a desire to change something in one of the doctrines, for example, in, in, in the letters Peter had sent out, they would have had to have an organization that spanned the entire known world and was able to get to every place that a handwritten papyrus document was. 
and change them all at the same time. But the New Testament spread rapidly, so there was no chance of that happening. We saw by looking at some of the existing manuscripts that these documents tended to collate in groups of three types. They were handed down as, as, as Gospels and Acts together. That's because Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were put into books together with Acts. We saw that the Pauline epistles were gathered together early on. If you go back and you look at some of those lists of documents that we have, they come in groups that are all the Pauline epistles. And then we have the remaining, the Catholic letters as they're called, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, 1st, 2nd Peter. Um, uh, so, so that's what we saw in history. And these existing papyri give us a good picture, at least of the transmission of the first of those two groups, the Gospels and Acts and the Pauline epistles. And we know that they were rapidly spread all around the world early on and that they were translated, but something happened significant to the transmission of Scripture in 313 A.D. This is a painting of Raphael uh, of the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. This is actually in uh, the Vatican. At the time, the emperor of Rome was deceased, and there were two countering claims to his empire. Constantine, who was in Europe, claimed to have the right to the throne. And uh, Maxentius, who was in Italy, claimed to have the right to the empirical throne. So they went to war against each other, and on the march down, Constantine was said to have gotten a vision of the Greek letter Chi, which looks like a cross. And with that vision that he had received, he, he heard word that, by this sign, you will be victorious. And so he had that cross painted on the arm, uh, 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 what do you call the, the shield of his soldiers. And as they got to Milvian Bridge going into Rome, they defeated the armies of Maxentius. And, and that was significant enough for Constantine to allow the Christian religion to go from an illegal, illicit religion under persecution which they had suffered greatly at the hands of previous empire, emperors for the previous 300 years, to now they were allowed to exist. In fact, Constantine's wife, I'm sorry, Constantine's mother was a devout Christian. So by bringing together the government and the religion, there all of a sudden became oversight, much like there was under the Old Testament, where the governance of the Israelis of the Jewish nation was caused and, and a part of their religious environment. So the amount of variation that we saw and the, the home church worship changed and it became more of a, you come to an official building to attend a church service. And we start to see because of this, that this, this legal religion has given us um, the opportunity to, to have scripture that's able to speak in public. The types of manuscripts we see change from papyrus to vellum and parchment to, to very expensive materials. Instead of being one long written letter, we start to see them in groups of three columns or four columns so that a person speaking from a pulpit, from a stage, would be able to read and not lose their place because it's not a big long document. And when you go and look at these documents, that's what happened. A.D. 313, Constantine signed the Edict of Milan. He was in the West. Licentius was in the East. Both of them agreed to stop persecuting Christians. As a part of that, these great capital letter documents were produced. Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Alexandrinus, Codex Vaticanus, and uh, Ephraimi Rescriptus. Those are a, Aleph, A, B, and C. And they're very early and they're complete Bibles, except for uh, in the case of like Vaticanus where a portion is lost. The overwhelming majority of our documents prior to the 800s come in Latin manuscripts. In fact, we have more than twice as many Latin manuscripts 
manuscripts than we do Greek manuscripts. And this change, this uh, change to the text as part of liturgy uh, produces what, what we know today is what we call the Byzantine text. Uh, when I say liturgical text, what I mean is like in, in Luke um, chapter 2, when Jesus is found in the temple teaching at 14 years old, uh, it said that um, Joseph and Mary discovered Jesus was not with them. Well, the earlier documents say his parents. And what drove that type of change, what drove that was the potential that somebody might look at that and say, well, I thought Jesus was born of a virgin. If you say his parents, indicating Joseph was his father, you might be contradicting that statement from Luke 1, chapter, chapter 1, verses 33 through 35, where Mary is uh, speaking to the Holy Spirit and telling him, I don't know a man how can I be with child? Uh, so they, so these, these little changes that start showing up are done um, as an effort to smooth out difficult passages. The, uh, another example might be where uh, when Jesus was led to the cross in the Gospels, it said he was led with two other criminals. And when you read that in later manuscripts, that changes to Jesus was led to the cross meaning he, with criminals, not with other criminals. So that you take out that word other, and now you can't imply that Jesus was a criminal from that. So, so little things like that start getting changed as it became liturgical. Places where you might have in the Gospels, for example, where pronoun after pronoun, he said, he said, he said, get changed to Christ said. Because you don't read all 48 verses at once. You read maybe 12. And so when you come back to start again, we see that they put the person who's referred to. Today, we do that and we put that word in italics so that you know that the translator is supplying you information. That wasn't the case back then. So, so this growth, this change in the text begins to happen starting in about the 5th century through the 8th century. Prior to that, we had this Alexandrian text type. So that's the first major thing that happens is Christianity becomes a legal religion. The documents types change and we begin to see the development of the text in a liturgical type setting. All of a sudden you can have a seminary where scholars are allowed to study and pour over scripture and compare one with another. And they begin to have debates, for example, about the character of Jesus. Was he really all man and all God together at the same time? Or was he only God and just looked like being a man? These, these type of heresies that began to arise, we begin to see movement in the text that tries to help clarify and eliminate the possibility of error. There's a second significant thing that happened in Rome, and that is that the Roman Empire split. In 495 AD, I'm sorry, in 395 AD, uh, the emperor decided to resign, and rather than die and let Rome figure it out, he appointed uh, co-emperors, one in the Eastern Empire and one in the Western Empire. The one in the Western Empire was going to rule from Constantinople, which is where Constantine moved his capital, and the one in the East was going to rule from Rome. And this split began to develop cultural differences between the two halves in Rome. The western side of Rome stopped using Greek as their language and they moved into Latin. And we see by 404 AD that the Latin manuscript of the Bible that we're going to look at in a minute became the official text of the western empire. The eastern empire from Byzantine continued to use Greek manuscripts. Both of them together had the Bible. I have an animation I hope is going to work that's going to show the growth split and fall of the Roman Empire in the bottom uh, right-hand corner of the slide will be uh, a date. Minus dates are B.C. Positive dates are A.D. And so uh, let this slide play just a time or two so that we can see Rome starting right here and 
This is the Roman Republic in red spreading across Italy. By 200 AD, they have moved into Europe, into the Syrian. By 70, 40, this is the time of Christ now. The Roman Empire has crossed the known world. And as I mentioned, in 313 AD, Christianity became legal. And in 395, you have the split, the Eastern and the Byzantine Empire. And the Western Empire gets conquered first. And by 530 AD, you see the Eastern Empire. Um, that's when the animation slides. It doesn't actually fall until the 15th century, the 1400s. So keep this growth, this expansion, this divide in mind as we begin to talk about uh, what happens. This right here is... Um, Turkey, this is where Israel, Palestine, this is uh, where the Muslim empire is going to arise in 600 AD, and they're going to push against that eastern empire from this side, and they're going to um, eventually get to where they cut off the eastern and the western empire. All right, everybody seen the animation? All right, so... 400 AD, from the birth of Christianity until the great schism of 1054, there was no standardized text of the Bible that was accepted across all of Christianity. There were two texts of the Bible that were accepted across Christianity or more. There were two main, Latin and Greek. The Western side began to use Latin. The Eastern side retained Greek, but they switched from using all capitals to this lowercase type uh, writing. They began to put space between the words. They began to use punctuation. So um, as, as the Western Empire spread, as we saw in that slide, they began to translate the scripture out of Latin into other languages, Spanish, Ethiopic, Coptic, Western Slavonic, Old Church Gothic. There are languages we know of today only because we find translations of the Bible from Latin into them. And, and we see the Latin on one side and the, the language we had previously not known. But because of the rapid growth and transmission of Scripture in Latin up until 313 AD, by the time the Western Empire begins to exclusive, exclusively use Latin, there was a great many of variations that existed in the Latin text. In fact, it was so important that they locked down the, the text of Scripture to the church that they actually began to make it illegal to translate into other languages. And this, this fact is going to... Um, greatly influence the text that we have today and, and should provide us with a sense of respect for the English Bible that we do have. So the rise of the Latin Vul Vulgate, um, this Western Empire and the church in the West and this Eastern Empire and the church in the East, although they were using different language translations, Latin in the West, Greek in the East, overall, they were able to come together and, and unify over all of their theology, all the way up until uh, what's called the Great Schism in 1054. There were differences. Who got to be the head of the church, for example, was a, a significant problem with them. But in 1054, it came to a head um, over something called the Filioque controversy. Filioque is the Latin word for and the son. And that what they were trying to discuss is where does the Holy Spirit come from? Um, the Western church said the Holy Spirit comes from both God the Father and God the Son. The Eastern church insisted the Holy Spirit only emanated from God the Father. And so when the, the Latin word and the Son was added to the creed of the church, Filioque, the Western church decided uh, we couldn't be a part of that. So I have a graph that traces the major branches within Christianity. We have all Greek back here. And beginning around 313, Christianity becomes legal. 
by 404 AD, there is an official Latin Vulgate. The church is still one church until 1054. Now, uh, there, there were two splits that did happen. This yellow split that you see here of the Assyrian church. Uh, that happened because in Assyria, they believed that the nature of Christ was one nature. They did not believe he had a human and a divine nature that existed together simultaneously. It's called the monophysite controversy. If you see here the Oriental Orthodox miaphysite, that's much like the monophysite, but they believe that the two natures uh, came together to form a tertium quid, a third thing altogether. That's what that word miaphysite means. It's a, it's a new nature, a new type. You can get on uh, Theopedia and read all about it. It's not that exciting. They're not significant branches, but in 1054, there was a significant split and the liturgy changed between what was called now the Roman Catholic Church and what became the Eastern Orthodox Church. The reason I put this up here is because this entire time, 1054, all the way back to 33 AD, or maybe 55 when the first letter was written, for a thousand years they were using Bibles in different languages, in different translations. People were being saved. People knew who Christ was. They knew what the doctrines of their church were. One of the reasons this was possible is because Latin is a good receptor language to translate from Greek. The meaning of words in Latin have a lot of overlap with the meaning of words in Greek, or Greek and Latin. The, the, the nature, the syntax of how you speak in Latin is similar to how you speak in Greek. And there were two main versions that existed. The Old Latin, which existed before the church became legal, and then the Latin Vulgate. So here's a, uh, both are in Western branch of the Indo-European language. So this is what I'm showing here. This is their Western division. This is where classical Latin came from. This is where ancient Greek came from. This is a timeline of development. As you move down, you're moving forward in history. You can see that uh, the Greek language is actually substantially larger than the Latin language. And so when you say that a, a word in Latin covers a lot of the same meaning of the word in Greek, there's probably five or six Greek words to every Latin word. So you end up having more words in Latin to narrow down the precise way that that Greek word is trying to be used. We do that in English as well. Another advantage that they had is that these two languages were spoken together by people at the same time. If you've ever been to um, Canada, you know that French and English exist together in Quebec. And people there tend to speak both languages. And if they don't speak it, they at least understand it. If you've been to Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Southern California, you know that Spanish and English, although they derive from different roots, this is the English side, this is the Spanish side, so they, they're coming from entirely different um, branches here. There's a lot of contact between English and the Romance languages. So there was there, so potential for misunderstanding because word meaning or syntax wasn't the same was reduced. So Latin becomes a good translation for the Greek. Now, modern English is a long way removed from ancient Greek. It is very, very, very difficult to get an accurate and um, well-spoken translation in English from Greek or Hebrew for that matter because they're like fourth cousins. Actually, no, they're like neighbors of fourth cousins. <laughs> okay, but, but Latin and Greek, they're like first cousins. In fact, because they had so much contact history, they're like kissing cousins. Right? They, they lived to, right next to each other. They played in the same backyard together. That's not true of English. To say that an English translation is as good 
of a translation is a Latin translation is to ignore the difference between the language. It just cannot be done. That doesn't mean you lose the word of God, but you have to make decisions about the, 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 the beauty of it and the, the technical side of it. And you have to split that difference. And that is a choice you must make. And we'll talk about that next week when we talk about how translations are made. Let's look at the Latin now. We're going from Latin to Greek. So we got the history down. Oral tradition until writing starts with the epistles. As the epistles are writing, they're speaking of the gospel message as if it was already known. And then we see the development of the gospels. The early manuscripts show us that Paul's letters traveled together. The gospels and Acts traveled together. And then the other writings tended to be grouped together. There was a lot of variation and a lot of translation that happened until 313 when the church became legal. At that time, the text began to change to get uh, liturgical, to get ecclesiastical. Difficulties in Greek syntax, difficulties where people could misunderstand or, or apply wrong meaning to Scripture began to get kind of ironed out, especially um, as the church became more and more authoritative over people. But before that happened, we have the Old Latin. Uh, the Old Latin is before the Latin Vulgate. It came to us primarily from sermons or from handouts that were given to people in the congregation to follow along. It does not show up in whole Bibles primarily. There is one, Codex Bezai, which is a two-language version. It's got both Greek and Latin. Um, interesting enough, the ending of Mark in this is a, a unique, meaning not the one we have today, long ending of Mark. Um, it does have that story from um, the Gospel of John where uh, the woman is caught in adultery and Jesus says, let he who is without uh, sin cast the first stone. Um, Acts is about 8% longer than the version of Acts we have today. So we could see in this old Latin development of uh, text. The many variations help us not translate what the Greek words were, but tell us what was the Greek text that lied behind it. Although there is some good compliance with Latin and Greek, it's not, um, you cannot successfully translate backwards from Latin to the original Greek. Because there may be five or six different Greek words that you have to choose from that are all reflected in a single Latin uh, word, for example. So you don't know which of those six necessarily existed in the early. But you can say, hey, this Latin document has these different events recalled. So whatever source Greek document they translated from must have had those. They didn't invent them. So that's really the use of the old Latin. Um, 382, Pope Damasus I, recognizing a problem with all these variations and, and, and the community having access to different versions of Scripture, tasked the very best scholar that was known to that day, a guy named Jerome, to go get as many manuscripts as he could and produce a single authorized translation of Scripture in the language of the people, Latin. Jerome went and found uh, a couple of rabbis so that he could learn Hebrew. He translated out of a six-language uh, hexaplot, I guess, hexaplot, um, so diglot is two, hexaglot. There you go. Six language translation. This translation of the Latin Vulgate is very, very close to what we find in Codex Sinaiticus. Whatever manuscripts Jerome has, which we don't have access to today, we know from his Latin translation that we can identify his Greek documents are very close to what we find in Codex Sinaiticus. Remember, that document came from 330 to 350 AD, and it was produced on what would cost millions of dollars today in uh, leather, hide, vellum. Now, remember when this is happening, the Greek church is still using, or the Byzantine side, the, the, the Eastern Empire side, is still using Greek. They're not using Latin. 
This project for the New Testament grew until the Old Testament was translated. This Latin Vulgate lasted all the way until 1592 in that western branch of the church. It was revised in 1979, just for your information. Uh, and all the way actually until 1965, this was the only Bible that was allowed to be used in the Roman Catholic Church as Scripture, a Latin Bible. 1965. If you can imagine going to, coming, coming to church, and I'm speaking to you in, in Greek instead of English when we read the Word of God. This happened for 1930 years. Well, not really, because it was translated in 404. So for 1,500 years, people who claimed to be Christians and understood the main way they got God's word was from their sermon, from the stained glass, from the wood carving, from what they saw around in the world. They didn't have a Bible they could read for this long for the Catholic, Roman Catholic side. Now, there were translations to English that were made from this Latin family, beginning in 404 AD, into English. Um, but it didn't happen for a very long time because it was illegal to translate into English. Now, there was a, a very brave uh, Roman Catholic priest in England who we'll talk about in a minute. But I, I want you to understand the concern wasn't so much just to hold power over people. But the concern was that we're dealing with people's soul. And if you get the message wrong, you can be eternally lost. So the Pope today has basically the equivalent of three PhDs, speaks like nine languages, has been all around the world and seen every type of culture that exists very educated man. His cardinals, they're all the same way. So think about going to a medical practice and having a guy who has never been to medical school, doesn't know anatomy, physiology, chemistry, psychology, and he wants to do open soul surgery on you for your eternity. This is how they, they think of it. Pope Gregory II in January of 1080, made this statement. And there's many more. Not without reason, it has pleased Almighty God that Holy Scripture should be a secret in certain places, lost if it were plainly apparent to all men. Perchance it would be little esteemed and be subject to disrespect. Or it might be falsely understood by those of mediocre learning and lead to error. So that last statement is what I just mentioned, but he had other concerns. He said if everybody had access to it, nobody would read it. Or people would begin to disrespect it. Which I can't say he was necessarily wrong about those first two concerns. The last one I disagree with, with Luther, uh, in that we do have the Holy Spirit to aid us in our understanding for those who are actually Christians. But as I mentioned, there was a a very brave um, Catholic priest by the name of John Wycliffe who in the 13th, 14th century made a Middle English translation. And then when the Protestant Revolution uh, began to happen, the Roman Catholic Church had to allow translations into other languages to help as a defense to the people against what they were hearing from their Protestant friends who had a version of Scripture in their common language. Those two versions are the Wycliffe Virgin, version, you've probably heard of the Wycliffe Bible Association that translates Bibles, and the Dewey Rames. So John Wycliffe, uh, he was born in 1328. Uh, he died in 1384 from a stroke. He was actually saying the Catholic Mass uh, when he had his uh, stroke. Um, he was openly opposed to things that the Roman Catholic Church taught were important. For example, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that priests are a different class of person than the regular congregation. They teach that it's okay to worship or venerate at least statues and paintings. They believe that the means of grace like the Lord's Supper, marriage, confession, baptism, um, 
I can't remember the other ones off the top of my head, actually cause you to somehow materially receive grace from God. That's called uh, sacramentalism or sacerdotalism. They, they believe that when the priest announces this is the body of Christ, that the host he's holding up literally changes physically into the body of Christ. But it retains all the elements that we can see, taste, touch, analyze of the bread that it existed before. That's called transubstantiation. Same with the wine changing into blood. Veneration of saints that certain people are somehow given more immediate access to, to heaven. John Wycliffe opposed all of these. And because he opposed all of them, the Roman Catholic Church gathered together at the Council of Constance in May of 1415. And they declared him a heretic. Remember, he died in 1384. This council was 1415. 30 something years after he had died, they had his body excommunicated and burned and his ashes spread in the river so that they so that God somehow wouldn't be able to put his body back together at the resurrection. He was a forerunner of the Protestant Reformation. He translated the Latin Vulgate into English. His followers were called Lollards because they would go around speaking um, to each other kind of in muted tones, the scripture. His followers, the ones that helped him translate the scripture, were actually burned at the stake with their, with their books chained, their translation, their Engl Middle English translation chained to their neck while they were burned at the stake. He's commonly called the morning star of the Reformation. His translation was completed in 1384. It was a handwritten copy, of course, because the printing press hadn't been invented. The next Latin to English translation that happens comes in um, 1582 for the New Testament in Reims, France. The Old Testament was several years later in 1610 at the University of Douai in Douai, France. Or Douai. Or how, how do you Frenchify that? Douai? I don't know. Douai Reims. Uh, this translation was made as part of the Counter-Reformation effort. It is a Latin Vulgate, um, which was considered to be as authentic, if not superior to the Greek and Hebrew original, based on the comments that are made out of Vatican II. Vatican II was that council that allowed common language mass to be spoken, the Bible to be read in something other than Latin. But when they spoke about the Latin Vulgate, they said, you got to translate from English or from the Latin Vulgate into the local language because the Latin Vulgate is the, the translation of Scripture that was authorized by God's church. So they considered it superior to the original Greek and the original Hebrew. There's actually a um, Dewey Rames or a Latin Vulgate only group today. Uh, which is kind of weird. They, they do have some um, unique thoughts. For example, this, I'm sorry, a Dewey Rames only movement. They'll say, if you're going to read from Scripture, the only Scripture you can read from is the Dewey Rames English translation because it was translated under the approval and guidance of the Catholic Church because they say this manuscript, this English Bible was translated from the Latin Vulgate which is better than the Greek and Hebrew in their mind, the original Greek and Hebrew. Uh, they said that uh, the Dewey Rames renders a number of scriptural passages uh, that the translation is made in such a way that it supports the Roman Catholic understanding of theology. For example, in Matthew 12, 46, when, uh, Jesus, or when the gospel is talking about Jesus' brothers, they translate it to brethren, which could just be friends because they believe Mary is perpetually a virgin, that Joseph and Mary never had other biological children. In fact, they teach that when Jesus was born, he didn't uh, affect the virginity of Mary, that somehow he was born without the normal process happening. Um, so there is a, a Dewey Rames only movement, which is a little bit weird. Um, this version was actually illegal in England and Ireland for over a hundred years because they were the Anglican church, right? Not the Roman Catholic church. So heaven forbid somebody should read a Bible that's translated with affection for the doctrine of the Roman Catholic church. 
Um, this actual translation, because it preceded by about 40 years, the King James Version actually influenced how the translators of the King James Version translated. So the, tra the King James Version is essentially a revision of the Bishop's Bible. They did go back and look at the original Greek and Hebrew. However, about a quarter of the time that you see a difference between the Bishop's Bible and the King James Version, you can go directly to the Roman Catholic Bible, the Dewey Rames, and see how they decided to make their choice. In fact, there's even statements from the translation committee that talk about where they got their language for the King James Version coming from the Dewey Rames translation. The Dewey Rames, although written originally, translated in 1582, was revised in 1750 to update the language. Uh, part of the reason was it wasn't accepted in England for 100 years. So by the time they got to it, the language was outdated. The English was outdated. So they needed another version. So we just traced from 404 Latin Vulgate, it's used through the church to 1965. We saw John Wycliffe in the, the, the 14th century do a Middle English translation. And we saw as a response in the 1580s to the Protestant Reformation, a translation made called the Dewey Rames. We're going to go all the way back now and we're going to pick up that Greek side. Everybody following me? We're moving back from the Latin to English, all the way back to the Eastern Empire to where they were Greek. The rise of the Byzantine text. One of the things that happened in church history that influenced scripture is that those uh, pastors of churches who were serving as a long time, who were recognized for their wisdom and their ability to teach, began to oversee pastors of other churches and took this name bishop to themselves and, and, and they tended to uh, gather together in the larger cities, cities such as Antioch, Jerusalem, Rome, Alexandria, and Carthage. In fact, in the early church, the first kind of uh, ecumenical, that's the whole church council that happened, the Council of Nicaea, um, these are the five bishop heads that were given priority in the, in the church as a whole, Catholic, not Roman Catholic, but universal Catholic church. Constantine moves his capital from Rome to Constantinople. And when he does that, he brings that Greek text with him to Constantinople. And we begin to see a rise in unrest over theological differences. Remember, Christianity is legal now. You can sit in peace and you can study and you can start to break apart different words and compare letters one with another. You have whole Bibles put together instead of just the Gospels or and Acts, instead of just the Pauline letters. So we, we begin to see the rise of, of these um, heresies as a result of that. And in the 7th century, Islam became a force in the world that actually uh, caused division between the two empires. The pressure of Islam on that Eastern empire caused them to seek out help from the Western empire who wasn't interested in getting into a land war in Asia, as the good advice from the princess bride would say. And so they didn't. And this caused uh, rejection from the Eastern side. It was one of the uh, many things. So uh, this, this Eastern branch continues to, to use Latin, I'm sorry, continues to use Greek all the way until their empire falls. Their empire fell on the 29th of May in 1453. I think it was a Tuesday. The city of Constantine was laid siege to by the Ottomans. You can read all about how they besieged Byzantium and took it over. Uh, it's an incredibly interesting story about the ramparts of Constantinople and how they built it. Um, Monks had to flee from the monasteries as the, the, the um, Ottoman Empire came in. And they took with them their ecclesiastical Greek text. And I've already mentioned what that means. They're minuscules to Sweden. Um, and something else significant happened in history. And this affected the Latin to English side as well. But I put it in here because we had to talk about it at some point, And that is the movable type printing press was invented. It became possible to mass produce, to lower the cost of manuscripts and disseminate them 
uh, widely. And the Renaissance was starting. The Middle Ages were ending, and people were beginning to invest intellectual energy back in the sciences, back in the arts, back in the humanities. They were learning these early languages. So these forces all come together to help shape this Greek to English translation. So let's just look real quick uh, at Gutenberg. Uh, his, the Gutenberg Museum is in Mainz, Germany. I highly recommend you take some time to go. They've got like four uh, Gutenberg Bibles there. It's incredible. He was in Strasbourg, France, when I think it was his brother-in-law, and he decided to create something that would allow them to mass-produce printed texts. Okay, before this, you could print a text, but what you had to do is you had to take a, like a wooden plate and you had to carve out what you wanted in reverse script because when you stamped it, it would be in reverse and from right to left instead of left to right. And if you got, you know, halfway through the page and your S is going the wrong way, throw the whole thing out, right, and start over. But with the movable, um, uh, what do you call it? I just, the movable uh, letter, movable case, printing press, you could just go to the uppercase where the capital letters were and you could put a uppercase S. You could go to the lowercase drawer and get a lowercase S if you wanted. And you just put them together, cinched them down, put a little ink on it, stamp the page, stamp the page. Stamp, and, and all of a sudden you can reproduce without error as long as you put the case back together. This was a revolution in change. In fact, Mainz Germany had four printing presses at one time during the Reformation. And the very first thing they decided to print was a Latin Vulgate Bible. There are only 49 of these remaining. Ten of them are in the United States. We have one or two at the Library of Congress, which I think is uh, about the closest, shortest drive you can go to see one. Um, they're big. They weigh like 70 pounds. Uh, this is not the sort of thing you stick in your pocket or, or mail. Unless you want to mail it to me. If you want to get me one, it's a wonderful gift. I wouldn't turn it down. If you've got, you know, $40 million to spare on buying me a gift, that would be wonderful. Okay, so that's, that's the, the rise of the printing press. So how do we go from uh, these Greek minuscules to a printed Greek New Testament? We, we, we know we have these documents, and they're, they're traveling now out of the Eastern Empire back into the West and in Europe. And they want to get to where we can print a Greek New Testament. Well, the first effort that was made for this happened by a Roman Catholic priest by the name of Desiderius Erasmus Rotterdamus. He was born in 1469. His father was a Roman Catholic priest, a guy by the name of Gerard. His mother was his priest's father's housekeeper, Margarita Regerius. Uh, he actually had an older brother, Peter. Both of his parents died from the plague in 1483. As he was growing up, he was sent to the very best schools that were available. Erasmus uh, sometimes was thought to be the smartest man alive in the late 15th, early 16th century. He was widely considered to be the best Latin writer of his day. Uh, in fact, we know this because his great love in life was a fellow monk by the name of Servetius Regerus. Uh, he has several very passionate love letters that we have today that he wrote to this man. Uh, although some writers today downplay it because Erasmus um, never apparently consummated this relationship with this 21-year-old monk. Uh, he definitely wrote later in his life strongly against that type of lifestyle. Uh, some suggest that maybe Erasmus was just sharpening his writing skills. But those letters in Latin are uh, significant to us today, not because they tell us about the person or the, you know, like if we were going to reject Scripture because it was written by a sinful person, we'd have to throw out all the Psalms of David, all the wisdom of Solomon, all the letters of Paul, Pretty much everything except, I think, Daniel might be the only book where we have, you know, no sin recorded about a person uh, writing it down. Peter was prideful. John literally wrote, I'm the disciple that God loves, right? And he was 
Uh, which of us is the greatest in the kingdom sort of things, right? Like um, that, that is not a reason not to accept that God used a person. Um, so the best uh, Latin writer of his time, when he was 31 years old, he decided to learn the Greek language because he recognized there were problems in the Latin Vulgate and he wanted to print a revision to the Latin Vulgate. And he wanted to back up his revision with the Greek manuscripts that he had. So he lived in Basel, Switzerland. He had eight documents available to them. Two of these documents from the 12th century, he wrote on with his own hand and gave them to the printers to use as the print type. I mean, these are like priceless manuscripts that he's just doctoring up and, and using as the, the, the text for the, the printer. And he did this, and he didn't go search out more manuscripts because at the same time, in Spain, there was another version of a Greek New Testament that was being prepared by the Roman Catholic Church, but they were waiting on what's called the imprimatur of the Pope. They didn't have the Pope's permission to publish it. They actually printed 200 copies that sat in a warehouse years before Erasmus was done, but without permission from the Pope, they decided not to publish Erasmus was like, whatever, I'm publishing. And he did. Um, and, and one of the things he did that we can go through is we can actually see where he made changes in the Greek Testament to try to make it match the Latin Vulgate. We, we can see the influence of his presupposition that the Latin Vulgate, the church's translation, was better than the Greek and documents that he had. So this is the, the rise of the first printed Greek New Testament. And this printed New Testament became the basis for most other English translations for about 300 years. Some version of it. There were, there were 20 revisions to it. For example, Erasmus's first and second edition did not have 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, the, the so-called Johannine Kamam. Uh, his second revision didn't. His second revision is the one that Martin Luther translated into German. So, um, you know, Martin Luther believed in the Trinity without that verse. The, the church believed in it without that verse because they decided and, and made a statement of faith at the Council of Nicaea in 382 and not one reference to that because it didn't exist for a thousand years. And Erasmus didn't put it in because he knew it didn't exist in the Greek. And he actually said... Uh, I'm not going to print it in there until I see it in a Greek manuscript. So a monk by the name of Roy or Freud in England actually wrote one. This is um, Codex Montfortioris. It's in Trinity College in Dublin, England today. It was custom made to give to Erasmus so he would put that verse in his Greek New Testament. He actually wrote to a friend at the Vatican because he knew about Codex Vaticanus and said, is this even in your Greek manuscript? And the, the response back was, no, it's not. What are you talking about? Um, so he, this, this Greek New Testament uh, became the basis for English versions. The first English version that we see come from this Greek text came from a man by the name of William Tyndale. Tyndale Publishing is a significant publishing house for scripture today. Unfortunately, he used Erasmus's third edition of the Greek New Testament, and this was a problem because the third edition came out before the Complutensian polyglot. And so when Erasmus on his fourth edition got to see the version that was written in Spain, he made about 90 changes to his New Testament in the fourth edition, correcting it and getting it closer to the originals. Um, but he didn't look at Revelation, which is unfortunate because Erasmus didn't have the last six verses of Revelation in any Greek manuscript. So he back-translated from the Latin Vulgate into Greek and created a whole bunch of textual variants in the book of Revelation that, that get translated into English, even though there's no way they existed in the original. William Tyndale died as a heretic. He actually fled to Europe from England because it wasn't legal in England to have an English Bible yet. Um, he did not complete the Old Testament. His words, about 85 to 90 percent of his words, are copied into the Bishop's Bible, the Geneva Bible, the Great Bible, and the King James Version of the Bible. 
He was a master of the English language. Some other notable early translations, the Coverdale Bible uh, in 1535. Significant about this was it was the first printed, complete, New and Old Testament. This was based on Tyndale's English translation from the Greek New Testament. And Coverdale made changes based on his own translation from the Latin Vulgate and from the German Bible that Martin Luther had written from Erasmus's second edition of the Greek New Testament, the Novum Testament Omni, he called it. Another notable Bible that was early on translated from Greek to English is the Great Bible of 1539. It was called the Great Bible because it was big. It was physically large. It's almost four feet wide opened up. This was the first authorized version of the Bible to be used in English in England. Henry VIII um, commissioned it and gave it to the churches, the Anglican churches, to use. I have an example of some of the text that you would see in the 1539 version of the Great Bible. It reads, The Bible in English, that is to say the content of all the Holy Scriptures, because of the Old Oh, both of the Old and New Testament. Truly translated after the verit, ver, verity, variety, truth of the Hebrew and Greek texts by the diligent study of something excellent, learned men, diverse, diverse. there we go, the U is V sometimes in that old day. You can see how fun this would be to read, right? Um, so, expert in foreign tongues. Well, what happened to the great Bible? It's going to get revised. That's on the, the Britain side. In mainland Europe, though, they create their own English translation called the Geneva Bible. This was translated in 1560 directly from the Greek New Testament family that came from Erasmus. It's very strongly reformed or Calvinistic and Puritan in character. The significant thing about this Bible, it was the very first one to use verse numbers. So when you're reading through verse numbers, it doesn't happen until 1560. Chapter numbers came earlier by a scholar named of Stephanus. It was the first one to be available to the common person. So up until this time, uh, even if you uh, just think about this. From the middle of the 4th century, the 350s, until 1560, the average person, you and I, could not afford a book. And even if we could afford one, we probably couldn't read. Only about 12% of the population was actually literate. And even if we could afford the book, and even if we knew how to read, it probably wasn't even in our language that we understood. It was Latin or Greek so this was the first English translation that became available to the common person, accessible. Another significant uh, feature of this is this was the first Bible that had a translation committee involved instead of a single person. This was the Bible that the first um, Puritan settlers, not, not the first explorers, but the first Puritan settlers came across on the Mayflower, Right? This was the Bible they had. For about 100 years, you wouldn't be caught dead in the Americas with any Bible besides the Geneva Bible. This was the Bible that Shakespeare used. This was the Bible that Walter Cromwell used, John Knox, John Bunyan, Puritan's Progress. This was the Bible they all used. Then there was the Bishop's Bible. This goes back into England. In 1568, this replaced the Great Bible. The reason they made revisions to the Great Bible is because the Geneva Bible uh, had things in it where they would translate uh, monarch, uh, be, uh, like the, the king. They would use words like tyrant as adjectives for the king. And, you know, when you live in a monarchy, you don't want your people reading that you might be a tyrant. So, so they had to change uh, some of those. And, and because they were Anglican, they weren't reformed. They weren't... Um, Puritans. And we have the King James Bible as another notable early translation. This was a revision to the Bishop's Bible 
It was ordered by James I as an effort to counter this reformed Geneva Bible that the Puritans who lived in England loved. So he held this conference and one of the Puritans at the conference said, why don't you just make your own translation of scripture to help unify the Puritans in Scotland with the Anglicans in Great Britain? And so he did. He, he ordered 47 Anglican scholars to go back to the Greek and Hebrew and to produce a single authorized version for the Anglican church. All of these scholars were members of the Anglican church. And what they did is they turned in the most incredible, most memorable translation by a committee uh, to this date. It is um, almost... Of all the expressions that we have, apple of your eye, the skin of your teeth, uh, come from this King James Bible. It has influenced our English language that we speak today more than any document in history, probably more than every other document combined. It was based on the standard text, sorry, of 1569 uh, version. Uh, it was based on this, the fourth edition of Stephanus's revision to um, Erasmus's fifth edition of the Greek New Testament. I think I remember that correctly. Um, the, the version you hold in your hand today of the King James Bible is not the version from 1611. Uh, there were about 24,000 changes made to the version, mostly in spelling and grammar. Um, and this was done in 1769, and it was printed by Oxford and Cambridge. Interestingly, these two Oxford and Cambridge publishing houses couldn't even publish the same text. Although they had the same printer's type, uh, they, they had differences. Like Ruth 3.15, one says he uh, went to the city. One says she went to the city. So you have the, the he, she Bibles. So little differences like that. Again, they don't affect any doctrine. And then in 1870, going from Greek to English, we have in Cambridge, an attempt to modernize the language of the King James Version. Notable about this is that there were, for the first time in translation history, people who belonged to a different denomination working together. You had Protestants, you had Catholics, Anglicans, Episcopalians, which is just English, um, Presbyterians. So for the first time in history, we have an ecumenical council working together. There were uh, prominent textual scholars, Harry Ambrose, Scrivener, Edwin Palmer, Brooke Foss Westcott, um, F.J. Anthony Hort. Um, they demonstrated to the committee, mostly to their satisfaction, the reason for making about 30,000 changes, punctuation, spelling, insignificant things, rearranging verses where they found older manuscripts that had them in that different order. They used more than um, 12, I'm sorry, eight 12th century documents. The problem was they were not English scholars. So the document they made was terribly difficult to read and nobody cared for it. And so it kind of came and it kind of went. But in 1946, the ASV came out. This is currently... Um, on its third revision, it uses the USB third edition. This became significant because it was the first time the language in it was memorable. And so it became popular. And it, it started getting under attack because of its popularity. Kind of like Erasmus's Greek New Testament, because it was the first to get published, came under attack. And the people of his time said, uh, you know, you can't, you can't print this. It's missing this verse from 1 John. And you know, Rasmus says, well, it's not in the original documents. And so they go and make one up and give it to him to try to get it in there. This, this ASV actually was burned on pulpits, which is crazy to think that somebody would take the word of God and burn it in a church on a stage. I'm just absolutely incredible. What, what can we conclude from this? For about 1,300 years, you and I in the pulpit would not have access to scripture personally. And the scripture that they heard from the pulpit was scripture that had been changed to make it liturgical. Not doctrinally changed, 
just changed in the words to present it to the people in a way that was more understandable. The document you hold in your hand or on your phone today was prepared and produced and given to you through tremendous sacrifice. People being burned at the stake for their faith and wanting to get the word of God into the hand of the common man. And by doing so, we launched the Protestant Reformation. Average people today can open up scripture and challenge what is said from the pulpit, from seminaries. They can commune directly with God by hearing his word and hearing from his Holy Spirit. Our next class, we're going to talk about how do you make that translation? Why, when I was showing you that chart and English was so far away from old Greek, is that a problem? And how do we overcome that problem? How can I know that the English translation I have is a good translation from the Greek and Hebrew? And why I personally use the English Standard Version to preach from, in case you're interested. I realize we went 10 minutes long, and I can't take questions. So I hope this finds you well, and I pray that uh, we will be all together again soon when this coronavirus uh, business ends. Thank you for your attention.